Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, we're continuing on in our Fruit of the Spirit series, and uh, we're just kind of breaking down each of the nine fruit of the Spirit and seeing what God has for us in each one of those. But as we always do, we're going to completely read through the entire passage uh, and just to see the context and everything that God's got in there for us. So here we go, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, Paul writes, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's our key verses right here, but... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So it was a couple of weeks ago that we were in the fruit of the Spirit. I know Pastor Tony preached one week, and then of course Mike filled in last week. I really appreciate both of those guys for uh, jumping in on that. They both did an awesome job. I was able to watch them. So, um, But a couple few weeks ago, we took two weeks and we talked about faithfulness, which is kind of a big thing in the world of faith, in the world of Christendom, right? So faithfulness, uh, we looked at six different facts about faithfulness real quick. Number one, faithfulness results in blessing. Number two, sometimes faithfulness results in persecution or opposition. Number three, faithfulness breeds confidence. Number four, faithfulness breeds loyalty. Number five, faithfulness causes others to believe. And here was the big one. Number six, faithfulness stands strong in the face of storms. And we talked about staying faithful when storms come along in life. When those unexpected things hit us and we're like, where did that come from? And most of the time, guess what? We weren't ready for it, were we? And those storms hit us and just like that hurricane, remember that picture that we showed? And it just levels everything around us. But if our house is built on a firm foundation, it will stand. And of course, that house is our lives. So the big question was, how do we remain faithful? How do you stay faithful during those storms? And the answer is we remember that God's faithful to us. We can look back and see so many times throughout history about how God is so faithful to us. And, and maybe if you're in a pit right now, if you're in a storm, you're like, I, I don't think God is being faithful to me. And, and it may seem like that, absolutely. We can always look back at the cross, that God loved you enough and loves you now enough that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. That's, that's being pretty faithful. So the big question that we asked at the end was, are you building a house that is meant to last. When, not if, not oh it might come, when the storm comes and hits you again, and then probably again, and then probably when you're down it's going to kick you while you're down too, right? Because that's what storms do. Are you building a house that is meant to last? Do you have the faithfulness that it takes to withstand any storm? 
So, here we go. Back to verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and what is our last, or, or our next one, I should say? Gentleness. Gentleness, that's what we're going to talk about today. So our title for today is Fruit of the Spirit, Part 15, The Benefit of Gentleness. We're going to look at why there is a benefit, and, and, and that kind of seems counterintuitive. It kind of seems contrary to what this world says, but there is such a benefit of living in gentleness. So as I looked up the word gentleness, there's a Greek word that actually described it. It's called proutis. Everybody say proutis. Okay, see, so you learned some Greek today. If you, knew, if you know nothing else, you came to church and you learned, learned a Greek word. Proutis is another word for meekness. And we kind of look down on that word a little bit, but we'll talk about that. But proutis is this gentle strength which expresses power with reserve and gentleness. It's kind of, we kind of have this dichotomy here, these, these two things happening. It's this gentle strength, and, and it's expressed or it's displayed by power with reserve and gentleness, or meekness as they used to say it, but again, we don't use that word a whole lot. Why? What, what do we equate meekness with? Weakness. We look at meekness and we go, uh, meekness is weakness, and so I don't want to be a meek person, I need to be a strong person, but actually, meekness is the strength. It's quite the opposite of that. Um, in the Old English, there was a phrase, and it was called meeking a horse. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before, meeking a horse? How about breaking a horse? Have you ever heard of breaking a horse? It's the same thing, but they used to call it meeking a horse. And what it is, it was the process of transitioning this wild stallion. I mean, you would have this big, beautiful, powerful beast that there was no way that you were going to hop on the back of this thing. You would be bucked off in an instant. It would bite you. It would run away from you. And they would capture these horses, these wild stallions, and they would train them, they would meek them to a rideable horse. Now, here's the big question. The horse, after it was meeked, was it still the same powerful horse? Like, did it say, still have that same power? Yes, it did. But it was power under reserve. That's what meekness is. That's what proutess is. And that's what gentleness is. Michael Koulianos says this. He says, proutess is an interesting word. Aristotle defined it as the correct mean, which is the middle or the balance, the correct mean between being too angry and never being angry at all. It is the quality of the man whose anger is so controlled that he is always angry at the right time and never at the wrong time. Which, pause for a second, we're going, wait a minute. I thought we weren't supposed to get angry. Actually, Scripture says, be angry and sin not. So there is a time to be angry, and he describes it. It says, it describes the man who is never angry at any personal wrong he may receive. That's the key right there. But who is capable of righteous anger when he sees others wronged. See, that's when we are supposed to get angry. That's when we are supposed to get defensive and emotional and worked up when we see injustice. I am angry at slavery. I think uh, as of a couple years ago, there was 27 million slaves in the world, more than any other time in history. I am angry at slavery. I am angry at child abuse and women abuse. I am angry at those things against poverty and hunger. But am I allowed to be angry when something affects me personally? No, that's not the time to be angry. And that's what proutus is. It's this power, this fire, this emotion, this energy inside of me and knowing 
when to display it at the proper time. So gentleness or proutus is simply power under control. So as we talk today, that's exactly what we're talking about is maybe having that inside of you, but knowing when the right time to let it out is. Proutus. Now, does anyone, since we're being honest because we're in church and we have to be honest in church, does anyone other than me want to admit they could use a little more proutus in their life? I'm just going to go ahead and put my hand up. Yeah. And about half of you put your hand up and the other half just don't raise your hand in church anyway. So it's pretty much everybody, isn't it? I get it. I think we all need a lot more proutus, a lot more gentleness in our lives. And see, gentleness or meekness it's not really a sought-after commodity in this world, is it? I mean, what, what, what do people normally do to get ahead in life? They kick, and they claw, and they scratch. They're rude, and they do all these other things, but we don't think of gentleness as a way to move forward. So I guess the question is, what is... What's the motivation that we have to change? What what is the motivation that we have to get that unrighteous anger, if you will, under control, to not be a more harsh person and be a more gentle person? What is the motivation of that? Well, Jesus explains it in many places, but in Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 5, the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, that's meekness, that's not gentleness, but I'm going to give you three guesses, and I'm going to imagine that you probably only need one guess on what Greek word is used in that verse for meek, proutus. So he's saying, blessed are the proutus, for they will inherit the earth. Now, inherit the earth, that's a big theological thing don't have time to get into that. Let's just even look at the first part of the verse. Basically, you could say, if you are proutus, if you are meek, if you are gentle, you will be blessed. Right there ought to be enough motivation, but the whole thing about you'll inherit the earth, again, big thing theologically, this is a big deal. Jesus is making a very, very big deal to us about being gentle rather than being angry rather than being easily stirred up, rather than just jumping down somebody's throat when they come at you. So gentle, meek, humble people are the strong people who are going to inherit the earth. See, I want us to see gentleness as a strength. And again, we don't look at it like that, do we? Because there's other worldly strengths that we think we need to get to move up the corporate ladder or just to move forward in life, to put more zeros in our bank account. But gentleness is a strength, and strengths propel us in life. Strengths further us along. Strengths are attractive. They demonstrate leadership. And gentleness is certainly a strength, and we're going to see that today. So today, we're going to look at eight benefits of practicing gentleness. Now, we're going to practice gentleness. It's not this automatic thing, because it's something that we have to work into. Now, that word practicing, it it always kind of gets me because I think of a, a medical practice, and like... If, a, if somebody's going to cut me open and work on the inside of me and try to fix me, I want them to not be practicing. Like, I want them to kind of have that perfected by then. Anybody else feel that way? Just saying. But eight benefits of practicing gentleness. Again, gentleness isn't one of those light switches that we can just flip on. And boom, we're automatically gentle people. We've got this. It doesn't work like that, because guess what? Your flesh keeps 
just that anger right there, and, and I've, I've got to be all about me because nobody else is going to be about me, which is, that's just a lie. And, and, and we, we let our flesh win. And so gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, so it's really honestly not something that we can manufacture on our own anyway. None of these fruit of the Spirit we can do on our own. It comes from having such a great relationship with God and letting His Spirit work in us and do something in us and change us from the person that we used to be to the person that we ought to be. And when that happens, that's when we start to display these fruit of the Spirit, especially gentleness. Now, this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to admit a little confession here, it's another one of those messages where I'm, I'm kind of pleading with you to understand that God has so much in store for you, and like He has a will and a way for your life, and He has set some rules and some just ways of doing life in place, and if you can just get that and understand that and accept that and say, okay, God, I'm not going to do it my way anymore. I'm going to try it your way. When that happens, breakthrough happens. Like amazing things happen. And, but, but, and then we just fall back over on, into our flesh and we think, no, 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 I've got to do this. But it's just, this is one of those messages again. And I preach a lot of these messages that it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you. Guys, God has something so amazing in his word for us, just in this one word of gentleness, that if we could just get this, it will drastically change things in our lives. So here we go. Eight benefits of practicing gentleness, and we're going to try to get through these pretty quickly. Number one, gentleness calms tense situations. Now, we know this, but do we always do this? Got really quiet in here, didn't it? Gentleness calms tense situations. Proverbs 15, 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up what? Anger. When we speak harshly back, man, it just, it just fires everything up. But a gentle word, when we respond in gentleness, gentleness it turns away wrath. Ecclesiastes 10, 4. It says, if a ruler anger, and when you see this word ruler, you can just substitute in your boss, your supervisor, anybody who's in charge of you or has some authority over you, you can substitute them in. So you can even put their name in there if you'd like. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. When, when, when things are just getting fired up and you see it coming, and we see it coming, don't we? Calmness can just chill things out so much. It calms tense situations. Now, breakthrough statement here. Did you know that not everyone that is harsh with you is really mad at you? Did you know that? Like, like when you, like maybe you walk into the office, you know, for the first time or you get home or you wherever and like just you don't even get three words out and they just unload at you. You're like, what did I do? Oftentimes, those people are not mad at you. They're mad at something that has happened they're mad at somebody else they're they just their patience is worn thin so if we respond back in anger at their same level what's going to happen yep i saw somebody else do it at the same time that i did explosion right but if we respond back in gentleness kindness we lower our voices. It's huge. It's a huge, huge, huge deal. Calmness or gentleness calms tense situations. Like, if you're, if here's you and here's somebody else, and they just come at you 100%, criticizing you, just super harsh with you, where does that put them? Right here, right? Now, 
what happens if you come back at them in like kind? If you yell back at them and you're harsh back with them, what happens? Where do you go? Right here, right? That's where you go. You stoop down to their level. Now, here we are. We're back to zero. Somebody comes at you really harshly. It puts you here. And you respond back with gentleness. Where does that put you? Up here. You're, you're, you're morally superior, not because we want to prove to them we're morally superior, but because we want to calm down that situation. We want to chill things out a little bit. We don't want to stoop to their level because that's often what they're looking for. So gentleness calms tense situations. Number two, gentleness exposes critics. I like this one. Gentleness exposes critics. 1 Corinthians 4.13, it says, we appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Now, when, when, when people criticize or wrongfully accuse you or they act irrational at you, right? They're, 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 they're stepping down that level. But something else happens. You're here. They come at you here. You're still in the right. Now, sometimes we do wrong things, and guess what? We deserve to get it, right? Men? Really, you're going to leave me hanging out here by myself? Just saying. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Okay. But if we're here and somebody comes at us and it puts them there and we come back at them and it puts us here, not only does it drop us a level, but guess what you just did? You know where I'm going with this? You gave them actual material to be mad at you for a reason. You ever seen that happen before? And guess what? That thing that they originally came at you for, that just goes away. And now they have every right to be mad at you because you just yelled at them. See how they twisted that so quickly? Oh, you've been there? Okay. Just making sure I'm not up here by myself. I'm preaching these things to myself, and I hope you guys get something from it. But we've got to be careful. Exercising gentleness often makes our enemies or our critics look wrong. And when they do that, I learned this thing not too long ago. It was so good. We need to listen to understand, not listen to respond. Guys, I'm picking on us again this morning. You need to write that down, okay? Tattoo it right here on your wrist so you see it all the time, whatever. We need to listen to understand, not listen to respond. That was worth the price of admission getting into this place today. I'm just gonna put it there. Titus chapter two, verses seven and eight. It says, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. We have to keep in the right to not give them any reason to blame us, to come after us. We cannot give them a reason for it. Now, as a pastor, I have received a little bit of criticism, okay? Just part of the job, and and some of it was undeserved criticism. I'll just put it out there if I can just use myself as an example and be honest, but I've found that responding with gentleness and with facts helps to calm those situations. It really, really does. I'll I'll give you an example. There was one time a few years ago that I was being accused of preaching a prosperity gospel. Now, if you've been here for more than like four minutes, I'm pretty sure you don't have that impression about me. Maybe 
it's just me. So it was quite a shock to me when somebody accused me of this. And they had some accusations, so they, they made an appointment to come and see me. So this was kind of a weird situation. So I was in my office, and I had a witness. And when they kind of came at me with this, they said, you preached a message called How to Get What You Want. That is as prosperity gospel as you can get. And I stopped and I counted to 10 because I knew the truth. And I said, actually, the name of the sermon title was not how to get what you want. It was how to get what you really want. <laughs> I mean, if we're being honest, that's what it was. And he goes, just like you, see, I mean, yes, that's it. I said, did you watch the service? Were you here for it? And guess what his answer was? His answer was no. And I said, so if you would have watched that service, you would have seen the whole service I explained that every person has a God-shaped hole inside of them. And their entire life, all we try to do is fill that God-shaped hole with stuff, with fun, with people, with substances, with, and I went on and on and on about everything that we try to fill that hole with. And I said, and the whole crux of my message was, only God can fill that hole. So what you really want in life is more God. And I did it very gently and very factually, and it was one of the best moments of my life. <laughs> Just kidding. In ministry and in life, we have to have some tough skin, don't we? Because a lot of stuff comes at us. But we can't only have tough skin. We have to have a tender heart. And we have to understand that sometimes people just have wrong information. Sometimes people are going through something that we have no clue. And we need to understand when we respond in gentleness, it exposes our critics. Number three, gentleness is persuasive. It's persuasive. And, and again, we know this. Now, what if I came at you and I said to you, you are so stupid. I can't believe you did that. I cannot believe you said that. And I just went off. No, there's scenario one. Scenario two, how about I do this? Hey, um, you know, you probably didn't realize, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure you, you didn't say it like this to mean it like this, but you know, you, you said something to me, and, 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 and I'm probably just taking it the wrong way, but, man, it, it really hurt, and, and, and I, I didn't want it festering inside of me, so I wanted to bring it in just to give you an explanation. Now, which scenario seems better, scenario one or scenario two? Scenario two, all day long. So we've got to be really cautious, and we, when we use gentleness, it can be persuasive. Because they're going to hear scenario two argument way better than scenario one. Because guess what they're going to do when you come at them calling them stupid and all of that? They're going to come right back at you, aren't they? So gentleness is persuasive. Proverbs 25, 15, it says, Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. And then other translations say a gentle tongue can break down rigid defenses or can get through to the hard-headed. Parents, <clears throat> talk to you guys for a minute here. I, mean, I think I'm going to hit everybody today, okay? Does screaming at your kids work in the long run? No. Now, in the short run, does screaming at your kids work? Yep. That's why we do it, right? But do they resent you for it? Yep. Do they hold it against you for a very long time? Yep. Do they lose respect for you? Yep. Unfortunately, do they adapt and adopt 
that type of behavior and that carries on for generations? Yep. So screaming at our kids, although it may get you what you want in that moment, doesn't really work over the long haul. How about this? What if every week I preached hell, fire, and brimstone and told you how terrible of people you are? How about that? Would that be fun? Now, a lot of people think that's how church ought to be. Maybe they were raised in a, a, I won't say it, a a church in the south of a certain denomination. Okay, try to be careful about that, okay? I was kind of part of that. Okay, but that's not uber effective. And, And kind of the litmus test of that is, is that how Jesus did it? Did he just preach hellfire and brimstone and tell people how terrible they were? Or was he kind of a friend of sinners? Yeah, that's what Jesus was. So, so I, could, I could preach that hellfire and brimstone, or I could say, guys, there's a God who created you that loves you so much. Like, like he wants the best for you in life. Like, like, he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. Like, he took all of your sin and hung on a cross and died a miserable death for you. And he has this amazing way for you to live in his word. He's, he's written it down, and here's where it is. And when we're gentle and we're kind and when we treat people the right way and when we love, God blesses us and we have joy and we can, we can endure storms and we can go through all this stuff and our foundation will be secure. So which one's better, that one or hellfire and brimstone? That one. Every single time. Why? Because I'm doing it with gentleness and I'm doing it with love. Gentleness is persuasive. Number four, gentleness is attractive. Gentleness is attractive. Harshness is not attractive. I mean, the opposite is true, right? You attract what you are, and you are also attracted to what you are around. There's these things, we talked about them a while back in our brains called mirror neurons, and, and they just kind of adapt to what they are, are just doing or seeing all the time. And you become more and more and more like that. And if you're a harsh, negative, unpleasant person to be around, guess who you are going to attract? Harsh, negative, unpleasant to be around people. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. When you hang out with bad company, guess what's going to happen? It is going to corrupt any good character that you have in you. Now, we can flip that upside down. Proverbs 27, 17 is one of my favorite verses. Uh, One of my best friends in the world, Josh Morris, he's a pastor in Hawaii. Uh, He was a missionary pastor in Jamaica. I've taken our students uh, there to Jamaica to do a missions trip. Just, Just, I mean, If I have a bromance with anybody, it's Josh, okay? And I can say that because Josh and I actually have a verse together. I know, it's really weird for a couple guys to have a verse. This is our verse, Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And we always claimed this verse over ourselves and claimed this verse over our friendship that we said we wanted to be iron to each other. Single people, single men, single ladies, all the single ladies. <laughs> Listen, that you guys got that is proof that you ought to be in church. Okay? I'm sorry. I had to take a drink after that. There's a famous pastor and author, and he asked this phenomenal question. It's so good. Here it is, a little, little difficult to understand. He asks, are you the person, the person you are looking for is looking for? Are you the person, the person you are looking for is looking for? 
If you're a harsh, negative person, guess what you are going to attract? No, 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 no. But I want a a, a wonderful, gentle man or woman. That's what I want. Yes, but if you are this, you're not going to attract this. And if you are this, you're not going to attract this. You're going to attract what you are. And we can't want one level and be on another level. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work like that. Are you the person, the person you are looking for is looking for? So gentleness is attractive. Number five, gentleness demonstrates love. Colossians 3, 19, it says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So here's Here's some more relationship advice, okay? Since apparently I'm just going to dish out relationship advice. Women desire gentlemen. You see what I did there? Women desire gentle men. Gentleness demonstrates love. Ephesians 6.4. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, can we, can we tell our kids no? Uh, yeah, I hope you do. Can we be very stern with them? Absolutely. Do we count to three or to 10 or to 847, 16 times, and they still don't do? Don't do that, okay? But don't provoke your children to anger means don't use your loud voice. If you have to use your loud voice, you're not doing it right. And so this verse right here is saying, hey, gentleness, when we are gentle but we are firm and we are resolved in what we are saying and expecting, that is what demonstrates love. So gentleness demonstrates love. Number six, three more. Gentleness earns respect. Gentleness earns respect. Proverbs eleven sixteen 16 says, A kind-hearted woman gains honor, but ruthless men gain only wealth. And you may be like, well, I mean, I need some more wealth, so maybe I should be ruthless. Let me just tell you, if you have honor, everything else is going to fall into place. Ruthlessness, harshness, it doesn't work out in the long end, but a kind-hearted woman gains honor. I heard this story a few years ago, and it just shook me. On February 3rd, 1994, was the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. Now, in attendance was President and Mrs. Bill Clinton, Vice President and Mrs. Al Gore, and over 4,000 people, higher-ups from Washington, at the National Prayer Breakfast. Now, I'm not trying to be political. I'm not trying to make any statement like that. But from those names that I said, we can probably gather some of the political opinions and ideas that they have. Okay, But nonetheless, this was an annual thing to have the National Prayer Breakfast. And they invite a speaker in every year to speak and to pray. That year, you know who they invited? Mother Teresa. So here is this tiny Romanian nun who is pretty much the epitome of gentleness, who devoted her entire life to the slums of Calcutta, taking care of sick, diseased, dying people. You want to talk about gentleness and somebody who was living like Christ? Just loving people in that way? Oh my goodness. This woman was gentle and she had clout. Because gentleness earns respect. As she's making her speech, I want to read to you a very small portion of what she put in there. She says, But I feel that the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion. Because it is a war against the child, a direct killing of the innocent child, murder by the mother herself. And if we accept that a mother can kill even her own child, 
How can we tell other people not to kill one another? I bet you could have heard a pin drop in that place. And to my knowledge, she didn't receive any grief from it. Now, I'm sure TV and media and people had plenty to say about it. But I bet not a whole lot of people said anything to her about it. Why? Because she had respect. Why? Because she had lived her life on display, a life of gentleness, and she earned that respect. Christians, that's how we ought to live, in such a way that we have respect. I say this all the time. Listen, I don't know about that guy. I don't know about that woman. Like, I don't know about all of her Jesus stuff and her church attendance. Like, I got better stuff to do on a Sunday morning. But they're awesome people. Like, I want them working for me. I want to be their friends. I don't, I don't know if it's the Jesus thing or what, but they're just really amazing people that just make me feel good when I'm around them. Church, that's how we ought to be. And when you're displaying the opposite of gentleness, guess what happens to that witness? Right out the window. Gentleness earns respect. Two more. Number seven, gentleness witnesses to unbelievers. 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. There's two things that I get from this verse. Number one, you've got to be living in such a way that people ask you why you have such hope probably in the midst of a storm, how is it that you can remain happy? Like, I know what you're going through. How is it that you can still have a smile on your face? So number one, we have to live in a way that allows people to see that difference in us. And then number two, when we give that reason for the hope, we don't say, well, it's because I'm going to heaven and you're going to hell, and I'm happy about it. But it's sometimes people act like that. So we've got to answer them, hey, it's because I have a God who loves me. And that same God loves you. And he gives you that opportunity to be his child. And it says, and you do so with what? Gentleness and respect. I've heard this said, it's much easier to win a friend to Christ than an enemy, isn't it? Much, much, much easier. So gentleness witnesses to unbelievers. And the last one, number eight, gentleness makes me like Jesus. Gentleness makes me like Jesus. Now, that might not sound super appealing at first glance, but listen to these verses. This is, again, Jesus speaking. In Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28, Jesus says, just now... If you want to close your eyes, you can. You don't have to. But I I want you to hear Jesus saying these words to you, okay? In the midst of crazy, I want you to hear these words. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wow. That's a pretty good offer, isn't it? I mean, the offer doesn't get a whole lot better than that. So as I look at these verses, I see two takeaways just from these verses. Number one is our point. Gentleness makes me like Jesus. But number two, I think even bigger, even better, gentleness brings peace and rest into my life. Now, I don't know about you, but I could always use an extra dose of peace and rest in my life, especially around the holidays. And and it's just not exactly peaceful and restful because of all of the great things that we have going on. For some of you, I know the holidays are not a very pleasant time, and I get that. 
So I think every single one of us, for one reason or another, could use a little extra peace and rest. But see, that's what following Jesus does. When we actually say, um, okay, I'm going to stop pretending, but I am going to live by these guidelines that you get, give to me, not because God is all about rules, not because God is all about keeping his thumb just right down on us and controlling us all the time, but because God gave us this instruction for a way to live. Just, I took one word today out of the nine fruit of the Spirit, and I think I showed every single one of us, I know I showed myself that if I just adapted this one word, this one principle to my life, things would be so much different. And so when we get on board with, hey God, you do want the best for me. Hey God, living like you want me to will benefit my life way better than I could do it on my own. When we understand that, everything changes. When we finally decide to say, hey God, I've done it on my own long enough. Like, I I have lived according to my own rules and my will and my way, like Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. How'd that work out? When we finally say, God, all right, fine. I'm going to give you my life. That's it. I, I, I can't do it anymore. I don't have peace, no matter how far I've searched for it, no matter how many things I've done, no matter how many things I've bought, no matter nothing. God, it's you now. It's all about you now. When we finally get that, it's like that yoke that those verses talking about, that burden is lifted off of our shoulders. And Jesus says, give it to me, I can take it. That's what he is offering to us, church. And gentleness is just one of those very, very, very small parts, but a crucial part that will bring us to that. Let's pray. God, thank you that you make it so clear. You make it so simple for us. God, I'm sorry that we complicate your word so much but it's really simple. You want the best for us. So God, help us to understand that that there's no tricks, there's nothing that you uh, are trying to get out of us except just for us, for our love. God, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. God, thank you that we don't have to try to earn our way into heaven. That just doesn't work. But God, thank you that you paved a way through Jesus. And thank you that we are getting ready to celebrate in a couple of weeks his birth. And God, I know that there are some people here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who have not taken that step to give you their lives. Right now, in this moment, Lord, convict their hearts. God, show them that there is a better way to live. Not only in this life, but there is such a better way to spend eternity. So if that's you in this moment, that you are without Christ, heads are bowed, eyes are still closed. If you've decided today is the day that I want to give my life to Jesus, today it it just... It sounds too good to be true, but I want it. If that's you this morning, would you just simply say this? You can say it out loud. You can say it in your heart. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I put my full faith and my full trust in you. Be my savior. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out or make any commotion, but would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today for the first time. Like today, I decided to give my life to Jesus. Just slip your hand up. 
so I can pray for you. Jesus, thank you so much that you are good. Thank you, God, that you are still in the business of saving souls. God, help us as the church, as believers, to be a witness for you in a way that this world looks at us and says, I I, I want that. Whatever that is, I want it. And God, help us to point them directly to you. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, use it in an awesome way. God, be honored by the generosity of this church. And God, help us to be generous to this community and to be generous in this world. And we love you, Lord. It is in your awesome name that we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.